My name is Dr. Ken Christie. I'm the program head and a professor in the Human Security and Peacebuilding graduate program at Royal Roads University. And I'm the president of the Confederation of University Faculty Associations of British Columbia, or CUFA BC. CUFA BC is the provincial voice for more than 5,500 university professors, instructors, lecturers, and academic librarians at five research universities across the province. We work with the faculty associations at Royal Roads University, Simon Fraser University, the University of British Columbia, the University of Northern British Columbia, and the University of Victoria. I would like to acknowledge that the land on which Kufa BC's office resides is on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples. We acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, the Musqueam, and the Stoyo nations. We are here today to present the winners of the 2024 Kufa BC Distinguished Academic Awards. These awards honour the outstanding scholarship and public policy contributions of distinguished academics in British Columbia. Academics whose scholarly activity have made significant contributions to the community beyond the academy. We believe that the ideas that flow from universities contribute in significant ways to the public good, to our citizenry and to our democratic landscape, our intellectual life and our economy. The awards demonstrate the necessity and vitality of public universities, especially the value of research. I'm pleased to present the winner of the 2024 Kufa BC Ihar Boinoski Academic of the Year Award to Dr. Amy Parent. This award recognizes a recent outstanding scholarly contribution to the community beyond the academy. Receiving this award represents the admiration of colleagues from across institutions, disciplines, geographic borders, and beyond. Dr. Parent joins us to talk about her research. Thank you, Ken. Could you tell us a little bit about your research interests? Yeah, so my research interests are very much focused at the moment on Indigenous research governance, as well as working with Indigenous knowledge systems and Indigenous methodologies and all the research projects I engage with. Now, uh, your nominator has described your groundbreaking work in expanding Indigenous research methodologies and governance and decolonizing museum practices. Uh, could you tell me about your project raising Nishka language sovereignty and land-based education through traditional carving knowledge? So I first learned about the Nistal totem pole almost five years ago when I went to visit my chief, and in our language we call him Samogit, Samogit Nistal. And I'd actually gone over to his house for a different purpose. I was doing some research on Niska language revitalization, and I'd found some sensitive spiritual information on our house, and I thought I should go share it with him and ask him what I should do with it. And upon hearing that I was engaging in a research project and I had grant funding, he started telling me about our totem pole and the Nisdal totem pole. There was an original one that he knew had been stolen and was sitting in Scotland. And so he'd asked me to find out more information about the pole, uh, its, its exact location, and a little bit more information about one of the names that was attached to the pole because we were going to be having a feast in four months' time and he wanted to be able to give that name out at the feast. In addition to that, he also asked me if he could use some of that grant funding to help raise a new totem pole. And of course, I had to tell him that that funding was already earmarked. Um, but I went away and I did listen to what he said. And he'd also said that at um, one point in history, not too long ago, prior to the ratification of the Niska Final Agreement, that we did have a delegation go to Scotland and they went into the museum where the totem pole was located and they'd asked for it to have it returned. And at that time, the museum officials had actually told them that the pole was too old to be moved. And so when I went away and I started doing a little bit more research on the pole, I discovered that it was sitting in the National Museums of Scotland in Edinburgh. And since that first delegation had gone there, um, they had moved the pole. And in fact, they had moved the pole three times and the entire history it was there. Mm. And so that made me really angry. And so I went back to Samogat Nistal and I said, you know, why don't we write a grant and why don't we see if we can go over there and we can bring it home. And so I partnered with our local village government in the Niska Nation, uh, the Lackalzot Village Government, and that's what we did. And so we successfully received a uh, Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada Shirk Exploration Grant. Mm -hmm. 
And um, it enabled us to support the carving of a new totem pole, uh, which we ultimately um, passed along to another house uh, through our, our hereditary system. Um, but then it also enabled us to form a delegation and go to Scotland and to let the government of Scotland, as well as the National Museums of Scotland, know that we wanted our pole returned to us. Um, prior to going to Scotland, I did a lot of research and a lot of background uh, details and preparation. Um, but we also assembled a really great team that came with us. So it wasn't just me and Samong and Eastall, but we also brought with us a team of people who had just amazing talents and gifts that supported our negotiations. And so we were joined by Donald Leeson, uh, Pamela Brown, Andrew Robinson, Teresa Schober, Shauna McKay, and myself. And I can say that when we first walked into the National Museums of Scotland, uh, we went with much uncertainty, but we also went with even more determination. And I truly believe that we went with one of the greatest gifts that we have as Niska peoples. And we went with our hearts and our minds working together as one. And I can see that through an entire journey um, that we've been fully guided um, by the spirit of my ancestral grandmother who had this actual totem pole commissioned. And I, I saw her bring together the right team of people and every kind of twist and turn that we encountered in our negotiations and in even just trying to te technically bring this totem pole across the pond here back to Canada, um, she was there in terms of helping us move through some of those barriers. Um, but when we did first arrive uh, that first time in August of 2022 on the doorsteps of the National Museums of Scotland, so we expressed to uh, the National Museum of Scotland's board, as well as to Mr. Robertson, who was the cabinet secretary for the Constitution of External Affairs and Culture for the Government of Scotland, um, that our reason for going to Scotland was actually quite simple, right? It was very simple. We wanted our children to wake up every day and not have to work so hard for, to learn the stories of who we are. And we wanted them to be able to do that with every breath that they take. Mm -hmm. So we spoke to them that day about the troubling imperial and colonial history that we have all inherited, but we all have the future to change. We also cited important legislation that supported our, our desire to have the poll returned to us and of course of most significance to our case and I do have an article in the Canadian Museums Association uh, that speaks a little bit more in depth about that. Um, but we did cite the NISCA final agreement uh, which was a self-governance treaty between Canada, British Columbia and our nation. Uh, specifically we had chapter 17 that supports the repatriation of NISCA cultural treasures and belongings. And in addition to that, I think the other really big piece of um, important international legislation was the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We voiced our assertions uh, to the government of Scotland um, that we were a self-governing nation. So that actually made us quite unique in terms of that negotiation process and that we did not need Canada or British Columbia with us on that trip. However, of course, we were very appreciative of their support uh, to help us get that totem pole home since that time. Um, but we'd done our research, as I mentioned, um, prior to arriving on those doorsteps. So I had began attending several conferences in the UK, um, specifically around a critical museum studies, in order to begin building solidarity um, with folks who specialize in the field. Because again, I don't have a PhD in totem pole rematriation. Um, I'd also wrote a book chapter with one of our respected uh, chiefs, and his name was uh, Samagat Duke. And his English name is Chief William Moore. And he had actually, he still holds the oral memory of that pole's theft. And so we wrote a book chapter that was published in a critical um, Scottish uh, book, um, Scottish Transnationalisms. And that book chapter we also used as part of our uh, claim for the permanent transfer of the totem pole, in addition to the oral testimony that we had provided to the museum that day. But in terms of some of the oral research uh, that we did, so our rematriation story uh, begins somewhere in the 1860s and the 1870s when our ancestral grandmother, Joanna Moody, had the Nistal Memorial Pole commissioned. Um, we know that she had the pole carved to honor Zawit, and Zawit was a fallen warrior. And when you actually look at her totem pole, you can see his name being carved in a crest on the pole, and it's the raven crest on the bottom, and I actually carry the female version of that name. Um, but we know that she would have commissioned Oye, who was a prolific carver at that time, and that Joanna undertook her leadership in a time of duress. And so what that meant for us as Nisqap peoples is that she would have undertook leadership in one of the most significant times of genocide that we would have ever really experienced as Nisqap peoples. And she had to have this pool commissioned in a time of deep grief for a family member. But we also know that she did the right thing. She did the right thing for our house and for our family. And like I mentioned, we have continued to feel her spirit guiding us in our entire journey in order to bring the pole home. I guess another point to consider uh, in terms of some of the oral research and some of the written research on the project, 
was that I also initially started using the term repatriation and I did it in an unconscious way. And as I began to look into our lineage and look into the story of Joanna and think about the fact that we are a matrilineal society, and so that means if your mother is Niska, you are Niska, and our lineage is just traced that way, then that term repatriation really doesn't apply to us. And of course, as my knowledge of museum practices deepened, I also recognized that repatriation processes are often steeped in patriarchal and paternalistic Eurocentric practices, laws, and policies. And so we were very clear uh, in our claim to the National Museums of Scotland that the return of the East Jaw Pole must center Niska laws, Niska knowledge, and ways of being. Uh, we recognize that our matriarchs hold leadership roles that are to be in balance with our respected chiefs and, of course, our beloved family members in our houses, our clans, and our nation in order to support our governance needs. And as I began to think further on the term rematriation, I also recognize uh, that it is an ongoing process for us. Uh, due to the colonial harms caused by settler colonialism. And of course, it's a process where we welcome our men, our two-spirit and our gender diverse folks in, in order to help us redress some of the imbalances caused by colonialism. So when we first went to Scotland in 2022, we shared that Marius Barbeau, the colonial ethnographer, who stole her pole, did so without her permission. And I think one of the really helpful things about his research, although most of it was quite harmful, uh, was that he was a very well-documented researcher and he took extensive field notes. And so it didn't take very long to find that he had documented that he had been given permission by the government of Canada, Canada in order to have our pole removed from our ancient village of Ankida. And interestingly enough, it was actually Duncan Campbell Scott himself who had signed off on those orders. Um, of course, we know now that Canada never had that permission. And so we let the people of Scotland know that we wanted the spirit of this pole uh, to be free in our motherlands where it belonged. In our oral testimony, we also told the National Museums of Scotland uh, that we expected that we wanted our full return without conditions, no conditions uh, to our house and to the National Museums of Scotland, and that we expected our Niska Ayuk, which is our law and our protocols to be centered and respected rather than following a procedure that was dictated by Scottish law. We had reviewed uh, the National Museums of Scotland's, um, what they would call their repatriation policy. Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's called the Procedure for Considering Requests for the Permanent Transfer of Collection of Objects to Non-UK Claimants. And after reviewing it, uh, we explained to them that it wasn't relevant for our discussion. And we explained that it was not, we weren't just talking about semantics, um, but we saw that there were fundamental differences in terms of the ontological and the epistemological differences in understanding the living and the spiritual nature of a pole. And that was shared so eloquently that day by our leadership who was in the room. We explained that sacred belongings are not museum objects that can be owned and that a museum procedures only relate to belongings as property. And so we provided evidence that the pole was more than an object, it was more than property, um, or more than a cultural artifact, and it couldn't be owned or controlled by a museum. So we left Scotland uh, with a lot of uncertainty. So we agreed to wait three months for the board to come to a final decision. And that was a huge concession for me uh, because I went to Scotland and we went into our negotiations expecting that we would have a decision within three days. And it was our own delegation who told me to slow down just a little bit. And so um, over the course of that time, we returned to Canada. We did have to get a lawyer involved and um, to finalize some of our, our, our last stages of our negotiations. But I'm grateful that on December 1st of 2022, uh, we did learn that the poll would be returned to us. And um, I think it took me almost a week in order to process the news and uh, to really let it sink in. And there's been so many people that have helped us and have stepped in to do the right thing. Um, but most specifically, um, I think my proudest memory of the project, and now I'm going to cry, <laughs> was um, when we uncreated the poll and um, having our children be able to witness it for the first time. You know, it had only been me and Samogatni Stahl and my cousin Shauna who'd ever saw the pole um, as ancestors in this lifetime. And so when we brought that pole back to the NAS, it was the first time our nation and our children could see it. And I felt my, peers, my, my spirit was at peace knowing that our children had another story to tell about this pole, right? We have more than one story to tell about this pole and its strength to come home and how it got brought home, so. Yeah, I'm growing too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Your nominators described a core value for you in all areas of your work is founded in the Nishka concept of the common bowl. What is the concept and how does it inform your research and teaching? Yeah, for sure. Well, I think, you know, it's important to 
for me to reflect that it's a philosophical principle that's embedded in our language, but it's also a total way of life for us. And it's also been embedded into the UNESCO Final Agreement as it pertains to our lands. And so it's a holistic concept. Um, and when you visit the NAS uh, and you come into the valley uh, where we're situated, it's sort of like a bowl, right? And so we see that all of the, the, the trees and the salmon and the river itself are part of this common bowl. And so that we have to respect that common bowl, we have to protect it, we have to look after it. But also as Niska peoples, um, we have to live off of that common bowl. And so it denotes a reciprocal way of living in relation with each other and the land. Um, but specifically, we can also, um, at certain times, we can take out of the common bowl, but we also have a responsibility in order to add to the common bowl. And I think another core component of the, of the common bowl is recognizing that we're all not the same uh, as Niska peoples and that we all come into this world with very different gifts and different talents and different strengths. And so because of that diversity, um, we all contribute into that common bowl in a different way. And that there's a lot of humility around how, um, how we undertake that responsibility and how people contribute. And so for me, it's a guiding principle of working with the collective and the common good in order to recipro reciprocally share uh, everything that we do in our research and for each other in order to sustain ourselves and to continue on living in this world. Uh, part of this work required developing community-based research agreements and land-based education and relied on Nishka-led methodologies about carving poles within the language and culture. Why is it important to you to engage in community-based research? Thank you. Well, I think just going back to my other answer, um, we have a spiritual memory that guides us to honor others in everything that we do. Uh, I also recognize that I carry a lot of privilege. Um, I carry dual roles and titles. Um, so that means that I have a hereditary title as a matriarch, um, but I also hold a, a doctorate title within the university. And that I constantly am having to balance uh, both of these roles and the work that I do. Um, but in any hereditary responsibilities, we are always responsible for others. And um, we have to be able to uplift other people. And part of that, as being a leader, you need to be able to listen to people. And so I think it's, it's only very fitting um, that any type of research that we do, that we listen and we hold a responsibility to engage people. And so I consider my research Indigenous-led um, because I work as part of a collective and a part of a hereditary system that has guided me. And of course, that guidance transcends uh, from other generations as well. And so honoring the memories of those ancestors and everything that they've done to so, violent, so valiantly, valiantly, um, support us in terms of our culture and our language in terms of where we're at today. But I think in terms of my role as an academic, um, you know, nobody can walk into a community anymore and, uh, you know, become the sole de de decision maker on somebody else's culture. You just can't. And, you know, it, helicopter research, uh, it, you know, it, it doesn't work. It, it's been very harmful. And so I'm a huge advocate of recognizing the power of working with more hearts and more minds. Um, the more people we work with, I think the stronger we are and the better that we can learn. And I'm certainly not an armchair researcher. And so I, I, I'm, I'm, I like to engage with people. And I think relationships are a real strength in terms of uh, the community-led research that we do. Your nominator described your efforts to center Indigenous women's voices and perspectives in matriarchal leadership and to decolonize the structures of post-secondary institutions. How does your work support equity, diversity and inclusion in post-secondary education? I think underpinning uh, equity, diversity, inclusion uh, for me is, you know, recognizing the importance of decolonization. I always say that I'm not at the university in order to build an empire. I'm not there to make the empire better. I'm there to take it apart. I'm there mm -hmm. to dismantle it as an indigenous academic. And part of that is also um, creating better and more just relationships for people. Um, part of it is using our power in good ways in order to disrupt the colonial hegemony and all the different isms that we're Im impacted by. And certainly um, it's also a responsibility to work in solidarity with others uh, that are also in other um, oppressed situations and facing extreme forms of marginalization. I'm really grateful to be the Cassie Center for Educational Justice Associate Director. And a core thrust of the Research Center is to really support uh, equity and social justice in many different areas and working with a, just a, a brilliant group of women and racialized scholars in order to uplift this important work. How, how has your work encouraged 
better access to post-secondary education? I think uh, in my initial research, uh, my, my initial doctoral research really did look at that question of access and looked at um, access to post-secondary and transitions for Indigenous learners, um, recognizing the importance of different pathways into the university. And so certainly something that I always am drawn back to uh, in terms of my mentorship of other Indigenous scholars and racialized scholars in particular, in terms of recognizing um, some of the invisible and hegemonic constraints um, that students face when they walk into these institutions. And I think it's also important to be that mentor and to share your experiences and to highlight um, some of the barriers that we've encountered. I know for myself, I'm a first generation university goer in my family. Um, nobody else had ever gone to university. And so there was a lot of, demystif de I think, demystification that needs to happen. And um, there was a lot of stigma for me as well. Um, it took me many, many years before I actually felt comfortable within a university. And so I speak to those experiences to support other students who might feel like that and to really incorporate that into my own mentorship practice. Um, but in terms of the other research, I think whenever there is an opportunity to speak to the barriers and to ensure that there is equitable, equitable funding and better teaching uh, that's enabled for students, then I try to do that. Uh, we focus on mainly on your research, uh, but you're also a teacher. Uh, in your teaching, what is the most important message you want your students to take away from your classes? Well, this is going to be a short answer. <laughs> <laughs> I want students to take away the importance of being a whole human being. I think if we're ever going to reconcile anything, the first thing that we need to share with our children and our students is how to be a whole human being. And by a whole human being, I mean the spiritual, the mental, the physical, and the emotional aspects of ourselves. I think within a Western society, we are too often focused on only the mind or the body, and there's not an integration of all the four of those elements. And so I hope that they take away from all the classes that I teach the importance of becoming a whole human being and living in balance with themselves, reconciling yeah. that piece, but also reconciling that with others and also with the lands and where they live in order for us to live into the future. Is there anything you wish to say to the nominators or the KUFA BC selection committee? I'm sorry that you picked me because I talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to say a huge toiksini in our language. And so that means it translates as thank you. Um, but it also means that we are now connected. And and so I say toiksini to you. And I also recognize um, that the honor one is the honor of all. And that I come as one person from my nation, but I speak as 6,000. And so thank you. Great. Thank you. And thank you for joining me today to talk about your work. I want to congratulate you again on being awarded the 2024 uh, KUFA BC Igor Boyanowski Academic of the Year Award as part of our annual Distinguished Academic Award Series. I look forward to seeing your continued successes at Simon Fraser University.